going to talk today about automating the state. Uh, and, you know, the 20th century state was built on paper. Can we do better? Um, some of these ideas uh, were kind of prefigured in the network state uh, book, which version 1.0 is out there, we're working on version 2. And uh, we're also talking about some of the stuff at network school, which is at ns.com. Um, just to kind of motivate, and then let me get into the AI part of this. So the first half will be motivation, then the second half we'll talk about the AI part. The 20th century state helped build a high trust society, but it's ossified into bureaucracy. However, we might be able to reinvent it with technology, and I want to go through all the ways that we can improve the efficiency of government and also decentralizing technology to ensure equality and giving us time to finally touch grass and enjoy our humanity. Okay? So, um, kind of three sections the rise of the state, the decline of the state, and then reinventing the state. So let's start with that, that first. So the rise of the state. Basically, to understand like, what the government is, like why do states arise at all? This is like the Code of Hammurabi, maybe one of the first known instances of written law. Essentially, once you get a group past the Dunbar number, like past about 150 people, not everybody doesn't know everybody. And so handshakes fail, people don't remember everybody, so you need to have written rules, and written rules scale, right? And that builds the preconditions for wealth. And there's a lot of people who have been critical of the state. There's this great book called Seeing Like a State that goes through all the issues with states. Uh, but in some ways, even worse than seeing like a state is not seeing the value of a state. If you read Fukuyama's Origins of Political Order, he talks about how various kinds of tribes went through different paths to build something like the modern state. And one way of thinking about the emergence is the modern state is actually, or the Western state, is a, a technological phenomenon. Essentially, you had all of these little city-states, and they, they grouped together because they basically formed unions. Just like the United Kingdom that forms Britain is a union, Germany, France, Italy, they're actually all unions because individual little principalities couldn't survive on their own. And they used eventually, uh, essentially these laws, these, these, these legal codes, to kind of integrate and, and uh, unify all of these disparate peoples into one political entity. And so you can think of laws as being like the first kind of code, and you know, when a policeman holds up his hand and says that's an illegal action, it's a lot like Windows saying that's an illegal operation. Uh, in, in a sense, the, the um, judges served as interpreters of the law, lawyers were like engineers, and businesses were like apps on the state's platform. And um, it's basically kind of code before code. And um, so that's actually a very useful analogy. We can think of the state as a platform. Certainly that you know, analogy is not you know, unique to me. Uh, Lawrence Lessig has written about you know, code is law and so on. And you look at the diagrams in his book, and it really does look a lot like uh, you know, iOS or, or any other uh, tech platform where they've got APIs and they expose them, and they also constantly change them because they're trying to move forward, and sometimes the platform doesn't want certain apps, so it'll ban them. In many ways, it really is like a government where it's got written rules that you can abide by, and then the government will say, this is feasible, this is not feasible, in the same way the platform has written APIs you can use, and then it says is it feasible or not feasible. And you can choose between platforms just like you can choose between uh, tech platforms. So state platforms, network platforms are similar, right? Okay. So we can think of the state as a platform, and you know how is that platform doing today? Well, in the West, it's unfortunately not so great. So let's talk about the decline of the state. We just talked about the rise. Let's talk about the decline. So basically, many aspects of that state platform are now failing. Just, you know, for example, the Delaware judiciary. Uh, this is something that, uh, you know, Delaware was for many, many years just the obvious place to found a global tech company. But Elon isn't there. Uh, Dropbox isn't there. Uh, Ilad Gill, who's uh, a you know, very well-known investor, runs a large fund, a friend of mine, wrote this whole long post on leaving Delaware and why all these corporations are leaving Delaware. Where do they go? Well, some are going to Texas, some are going here, some are going there. I think eventually many will go to the internet and actually incorporate on-chain. But the point is that that API is broken, right? The Delaware API is broken. And there's other APIs, unfortunately, that are broken. For example, SEC regulation failed, right? Um, you know, essentially, the, you know, the, Gary Gensler, who is no longer running the SEC, waged this jihad against cryptocurrency, and his actions were called arbitrary and capricious. Um, 
Western immigration failed. It went from open borders to blocking tourists, going from one extreme to the other. Uh, you had Western education failing. You had a massive drop in educational achievement. Two decades of, of educational growth wiped out by the pandemic. And Western legislations failed, where essentially trust in government has just fallen off a cliff over the last several decades. And if you put all of that together, it's not just one thing, it's not just one political party or another, it's really a very bipartisan effort. Um, essentially, the Western state is no longer a model, right? Its own Western people don't trust it anymore. So what is the model? And some will say the model is China, but another answer is actually the internet. And with AI and crypto, perhaps we can reinvent the state. And so let's get to part three. So reinventing the state. So we'll need one concept first, and that concept is internet first. And what does internet first mean? It basically says that you know, the first thing that hundreds of millions of people, billions of people do every day, they're not necessarily waiting, waking up and saluting the flag, they're checking their phones, right? So their people are actually online. 99% of their transactions are online. Their communications are online. Um, they're, you know, their business is online, their customers, their friends, many of their relationships are online. And uh, you know, what that means is, in many ways, internet first, it's, it's a play on words. It's both a kind of a political thing, but it's also a technological thing. And w with using this lens, we can go through many different kinds of things and ask, what is the internet first version of this thing? And let me give some examples. So first, let me give some examples of what the internet has already reinvented, and then talk about what we can do with AI and crypto to reinvent other institutions. So the internet is mail. It's reinvented the US Postal Service. It's taken over from that, email and messaging and so on. The internet is mobility. It took over taxi regulation and hotel regulation from government regulators. And it actually also took over the, the rider side with driver's licenses. Um, the internet is Mars uh, because SpaceX took over from NASA. And in fact, the internet actually funds space exploration uh, because Starlink is what's actually funding it. The internet is money. Bitcoin has basically now rise, risen to become you know, a, a reserve currency. The internet is monetary policy. It's taken over from the Fed's monetary policy in part in many countries because it's got a predictable monetary policy as opposed to a chaotic one. And the internet is contract law. So this is replacing Delaware with smart contracts. That's actually cross-country international binding contracts that are, that are more reliable than Delaware. Finally, you know, the internet is freedom in the sense that zero knowledge, Zcash, things like that protect your freedom against uh, uh, surveillance. And so now, what else can the internet reinvent? So now we go to AI as a tool, right? That's to say, we define the application area first, and then we say, what can we use AI for, among other things? So first, we can have an internet first judiciary. This is a really good post in AI We Trust Part 2 on Substack. And essentially, this is actually from months ago, um, this author went and he took all the information in a Supreme Court case that was before the judges and asked the AI to predict the ruling that the judges would make and what it would be. Would it be 9 to 0? Would it be 5 to 4, 4 to 5, and so on and so forth? And Claude just nailed it, right? The only things that got wrong were things that were 4 or 5 votes that ended up being 5 to 4 or vice versa. And its reasoning was also better than just about any Supreme Court clerk and way, way, way faster, obviously, because of spitting it out in seconds. And you should read this guy's blog because, uh, you know, it can give very original interpretations of things. He can ask it, give me a creative argument that somebody would make, wouldn't make, right? So the reason this is important is if you want rule of law, you want equal protection. You want people to have basically the same legal process, whatever judge they go and see. The more predictable the law is, the fewer uh, court cases there are because people can predict what the judges are gonna do and then they don't have to go to court, right? So that saves enormous amounts of money on litigation and so on and so forth. It's like hitting an API and it just telling you this is legal, this is not a legal operation versus having to go all the way to a judge to decide and one judge may decide differently than another judge but an AI judge, an artificially intelligent judge might be much more consistent and certainly much faster, right? At a minimum, you could imagine this as like a first cut layer before you go to a court case which gives a guess as to how 
the judges of this or that circuit, this or that court would rule, right? So it's an internet first judiciary and it's more predictable than the Delaware judiciary, which people are abandoning. Next, let's talk about internet first regulation. So this diagram will require a little bit of explanation. Um, you know, in AI and really in just standard machine learning, there's this concept of a binary classifier. And you can actually think of what a regulator does as essentially a binary classifier. There's various companies coming through and you want to label the bad companies bad and you want to label the good companies good, right? And a bad regulator like the SEC would label the Bitcoin ETF bad, but would meet with FTX and label them good, and that's what the SEC did. So you can see in this diagram, like a false negative, the, the uh, Bitcoin ETF got a zero, but FTX got a one, and so that's a false negative and false positive respectively, right? And we can, once we have this framework on things, we think of regulators as binary classifiers, um, well, then we can actually start optimizing. There's a whole well-known, you know, AUC and ROC, if, if you guys are familiar with that, where we can just start optimizing the area under the, under the receiver operator characteristic and trading off the false positive and false negative rates and start thinking about a regulator as a binary classifier. And what, what's good about that is it doesn't just give a penalty for letting the wrong thing through, it also uh, gives a penalty for blocking the good thing, right? So false and negatives and false positives are both very expensive to society, and we start trading them off, right? This also applies to immigration. For example, if a German teen is like detained and deported, that's like a false negative, you know? And if you're just letting lots of unvetted people stream across the border, those are false positives. You can have a rational immigration system that's capable of filtering good for bad. Immigration, in a sense, is just like regulation. Singapore Customs, Singapore Immigration is making a binary classifier decision on every person who walks through. You conceptualize that as just a binary classifier problem. And then you benchmark and you see if you're getting it right or wrong and you can make it consistent. Again, you can still have a human reviewing the results of this AI, but you can take all of these signals and integrate them. A binary classifier can incorporate hundreds, thousands of signals, and it can spit out the decision and say why it's saying, admit this person, don't admit this person. You can interrogate that and you can modify that. And you can also train it on millions of past border crossings or regulatory decisions, so it's initialized with all the past data, and it basically models a customs officer or it models a regulatory officer. So again, you can have predictability before you cross a border, before you go through a regulatory process, will I get accepted or not, right? It's like a simulation version, we automate the state. For a fourth example, this is an obvious one, internet first education. So we saw the learning drop in, in Western education, but we might have the learning rise. You know, basically we're getting very close to having real-time video synthesis, audio synthesis, and language synthesis where an AI tutor, infinitely patient with the knowledge of Feynman and the values of your parents, uh, that, can, that can teach any kid anything in any language at any time, essentially almost for free. You might need like a babysitter to accompany the children and make sure they're staying on task, but that radically is more scalable than, you know, K through 12. Um, a much larger percentage of people can just, you know, sit with the, a child as they're, as they're going with a tutor. Um, and so you, you'd have something which, uh, I mean, the potential for that is, is really remarkable. So everybody gets the best tutor in the world. And then fifth, uh, internet first legislation, right? So many bits of legislation are labeled in a certain way, like a Patriot Act or a Heroes Act. If you take that PDF and you drop it into Grok, like Elon is suggesting, or ChatGPT, Claude, whatever, and you just say, what is the true title of this act, what would I call it, right? It'll say, oh, it's not the Patriot Act, it's the Surveillance Act, or something like that, right? And so that lets you digest this 400-page PDF and turn it into the true title. And then you can share that result, and so you can basically punch through the camouflage, right? This allows citizens to, in a few seconds, understand and get through all of the sort of verbiage and camouflage that the modern state, unfortunately, has evolved, right? And you don't need expensive lawyers to do this. You don't need to spend a whole day reading 400 pages. You can ask AI, give me the one sentence summary, give me the 100 word summary, the 1,000 word summary. You can have it say, give me the most you know, unusual things that are in this bill, all this kind of stuff, right? 
And so that means you can be an informed citizenry once again, right? So this is internet first legislation. This again restores trust in legislation when it's been dropping off in the Western state. We put all this together and it really means like internet first democracy, right? We use AI to understand the bills and you know, we can also use cryptographic identities to vote on them. And there's pieces of this that are already there online, like social, social media for discussion and AI for legal interpretation and DAOs for sort of you know, cryptographically voting on actual budgets. But the synthesis of them is kind of like internet first democracy. And really ultimately what we're talking about is internet first equality. Right? I mean, that's what the internet is. It's a peer-to-peer -peer network. Right? Most fundamentally, you know, with, the, with the decline of the Western state, most people uh, aren't citizens of Western states. So they are second-class citizens in a Western state if they're immigrants. Or, you know, 80% of the world, they're not on the UN Security Council. India is not on the UN Security Council. Many countries aren't. So they're sort of bystanders, right, to the world economy. But they're not bystanders on the internet. Every node is equal on the internet. It's a peer-to-peer -peer network. So they have the same AI, the same crypto, the same code. And so in an internet-first world, everybody's equal to everybody else in, on the internet, right? And so that means with AI, you can get high-quality education, you can get high-quality information, and high-quality legal interpretation. So this is a way that technology actually increases equality and increases uh, you know, the power for the people. So that's how technology can give us equality through AI and crypto. We can reinvent the state and put you on par with anyone else online and put uh, a decentralized AI agent or group of agents in your corner. So um, if you're interested in these ideas, apply to Network School. So NS.com, thank you very much.